This is Pente d'Atelo, a historic city in the Calabria region of Italy. Beautiful, isn't it? Quaint, settled in the mountains, just the look of it speaks of a rich historic background. Even now, few places capture such beauty. And yet, the population is less than 40 people. Now, believe it or not, this isn't the only town like this in Italy. In fact, there's close to 6,000 of them. So why are these towns so rich in history and culture, yet have basically no one living there? Well, to find the answer to that, let me ask you this. Would you want to live in this idyllic landscape if it meant there was little access to modern amenities, transportation, job opportunities, and even fellow people to talk to? A loaded question, yes, but it's one that thousands before have had to answer when they ultimately chose to stay in their hometowns or emigrate for new opportunities. But if this was such an obvious problem, then why were they even built in the first place? And what were the turning points for these cities, when people decided it was finally not worth it? Well, this actually goes back thousands of years. As we know, Italy has been one of the most culturally rich countries for thousands of years, from the Roman Empire to the Renaissance. They've been the cultural epicenter for what feels like forever. That being said, the idea of a unified Italy is relatively new in its long history. For centuries, southern Italy was home to mostly independent kingdoms, particularly Naples and Sicily. These kingdoms did their best against the many attempts of governments invading, both northern Italian and foreign forces alike. And of course, these kingdoms needed villages in which to grow and provide provisions. So when these villages were constructed, some as early as the 9th century, it was uncommon for people to travel out of their town, let alone out of the country. These villages lived in a feudal cycle of farming enough to feed their lords and themselves after. So when cultural hotspots in Florence and the rest of northern Italy started forming, many people put down plows and pitchforks to seek out a living in the cities. This is why many people, especially in North America, are able to trace their origins back to Italy. And the idea of tracing ancestry is actually something that's been of great interest to me lately. That's why I'd like to introduce the sponsor of this video, MyHeritage. MyHeritage is the most extensive family history service in the world, with over 19 billion historical records at its disposal. This makes it very easy to build out your own family tree, as long as you know the names of your parents and grandparents. This is something that I like the most, as for me, with my family being from South Africa, there aren't that many records I could find myself, but with MyHeritage's instant discovery features, they were able to find all the rest, transforming my tree into this, while I just kicked back and relaxed, adding entire branches to my tree with just the click of a button. Many of my family members, like this guy right here, came from a small town of just 319 people in Lithuania, called Balninkai. Which is actually pretty crazy, because I thought they all came from Kaunas. I was able to confirm this too because of their smart matches feature. I was able to cross-reference what other members who put him in their family tree had, and they usually all lined up. My heritage was even able to trace my lineage as far back as 10 generations, thanks to the records of the Genie World family tree, where I found I had an ancestor born in France. Which is crazy, because I thought my entire family was basically from Eastern Europe. She also lived until 94 which is incredible longevity, especially back then. From here, you can colorize or even animate the photos of your old family members that you found. So use the link down below or scan the QR code on the screen to sign up for a 14-day free trial to enjoy all the amazing features MyHeritage has to offer. Anyways, this moving started a cycle, where within each successive generation, there were capable youths who decided to move and experience a modernizing world. Furthermore, as centuries passed, the feudal lifestyle that existed in these towns as late as the 19th century began to become even less appealing, especially as power began to consolidate in the north of Italy. Even when Italy was unified in the mid-19th century, a mountain of problems stemming from such cultural differences soon followed. The dissolution of traditional feudal systems left many peasants and trade workers with far worse incomes and living conditions. Coupled with bouts of disease and the increase in crime, many found that they would have better opportunities somewhere else, particularly in the Americas, hence why places like Little Italy exist in New York City. From the mid-19th century to the start of World War II, as many as 9 million Italians said a farewell to their homeland to find better opportunity, a considerable amount of which came from these villages that now lie abandoned. But what about those who stayed behind? Italy is of course a land with a proud and storied lineage dating back thousands of years, and that's no less true for those who found home in the countryside, as well as the homes themselves. It's very hard to simply let go of such a rich history, especially when the remnants still stand, old but proud. But such historicalness is not without its history of hardships either. Many difficulties, stemming from poor farming conditions to disease, 
and even to natural disaster, would inhibit the peace that these villages were used to. Take a look at this map of Italy. Some of you may be surprised to see just how much of it is mountainous, and this next map may give further insight into the ghost town epidemic. These towns being so far into the mountains makes them harder to traverse to and from, making things like resource gathering and travel difficult, adding yet another layer to the remote nature of these idyllic settlements. In the past, this was easily remedied by creating largely agrarian communities within these mountainous regions, particularly based around animals like goats and mountain sheep. Nowadays though, such a slow lifestyle in a fast-paced world can feel frustrating to live in, since not everyone would want to go back to having to do everything themselves, such as growing their own food when they can get it done instantaneously in the cities for example. Further complicating matters is the loss of a young workforce. When your youngest and ablest leave for better horizons, it lowers the amount of work able to be done in town. For such strenuous tasks as agriculture and masonry, the loss of even a part of the younger generation can severely hamper the amount of work done, especially as years go on and the older generation ages out of the working age. Italy as a whole is one of many developed countries with a negative birth rate, and the eventual risk of an aged out workforce rises each day. Such risks are approaching even faster in the south. It's projected that southern Italy, where many of these types of villages reside, lost 28% of its workforce in the 2010s alone. Comparing that to the North's 18% loss shows the gulf in the rate of a deteriorating workforce. If such trends continue, then even more ghost towns will become well and truly deserted. Among the most prevalent hardships, as well as one of the most difficult to plan around, is natural disaster. And if you look at this map, with the first zone being the most severe seismic activity, these villages are unfortunately also right on their path too. Even one earthquake can put the aging infrastructure of these towns into too much disrepair to be feasible to invest in, forcing villagers to relocate to safer areas. Take for example the town of Krakow, now famous for its appearances in films such as The Passion of the Christ and James Bond's Quantum of Solace. Since the 12th century, it served as an integral military outpost, university center, and even the scenic home of four different palaces. The inhabitants weathered the storm of disease, Napoleonic occupation, and sporadic gang attacks over the years. But these things naturally have taken its toll on its people and its walls. Between 1892 and 1922, as many as 1,300 people chose to leave their home to escape the poor agricultural conditions. Even more were forced to leave 40 years later, because of a landslide happening as they tried to add infrastructure such as sewer and water systems. Disaster had not finished its circuit through Krakow, as a 1972 flood halted the repopulation and rebuilding of Krakow. The final nail of the coffin was the Urpenia earthquake of 1980, which left the town the ghost town we know today. Sometimes, like in the case of the town of Rogudi Vecchio, when it became uninhabited in the 1970s due to constant floods and landslides, they just packed up and moved 11 miles to build a new town, now known as Rogudi Nuovo. The same thing happened with Apice, a town that dates back to Roman times and prospered for centuries until an earthquake in 1962 essentially made it abandoned almost overnight. The entire population were relocated to a new town, located on a hill overlooking the old one. Today, just like in the case of Rogudi, the town is divided into Apice Nuovo and Apice Vecchia, the old and new towns. Natural disasters, of course, have been occurring for as long as people have lived there. But with many villages almost abandoned, the chances of repairs are next to none without outside help. Disease, especially prior to the days of modern medicine, also played a significant part in the dissolution of these communities. In such small, close-knit communities with little access to outside physicians and medicine, it's no secret that medical help is easier to reach in metropolitan areas than the countryside. And this is only amplified in these old, mountainous villages. Times of plague often coincide with mass exodus, especially to places people deem safer, or even simply being inspired to a new calling amidst existential stress. This is what happened with the town of Ninfa, located in the province of Latina. It was known for its beauty as far back as the Roman era, peaceful, fertile, and scenic all at the same time. It even had a papal crowning, with Pope Alexander III being anointed within its walls in 1159. Ninfa held on against invasions for centuries until a plague of malaria forced its citizens to slowly but surely desert the historic town through the 16th and 17th centuries. In the meantime, nature slowly reclaimed the land, until it grew overgrown with lush vegetation. But sometimes, there's no natural disasters at all that caused this. For example, with the small medieval village of Toyano. It was abandoned over time due to the isolation, urban migration, and economic hardship that I talked about before. All of these problems compound into an entrenching negative feedback loop. If a disaster such as an earthquake or plague happens, a town can be expected to lose inhabitants from diaspora or death. After that, there are less people in the workforce to sustain the area. 
forcing more people to find better opportunities elsewhere. That only leaves the most stubborn and the most loyal in these areas. Which is where we find ourselves today. Currently, these villages sit in an uncertain state. They are in more dire need than ever for repairs. Given there's as many as 6,000 Italian cities that can be classified as ghost towns, trying to restore all of them would be very challenging in terms of expenses. And more importantly, should they be restored? Or should they remain just a part of history that must be let go? Even deserted, they carry a nobility, a poise, and more importantly, the heritage of Italy itself. Well, the choice that Italy has made is to try repopulate them. Now, this is an uphill battle for multiple reasons. Not only because trying to repopulate and build a town from essentially zero is extremely difficult, but also because Italy as a country is shrinking in population too. With a birth rate of just 1.2 children per woman, they're facing a very serious crisis that's bigger than just these ghost cities. But that being said, it hasn't stopped them from trying. As young Italians increasingly migrate to the city and choose cosmopolitan jobs over rural life, many of Italy's prettiest remote villages have become abandoned, with tiny, aging populations that are beginning to die off. Some elderly Italians have found themselves with no one to leave their house to, transferring it instead to the local authorities, who have to decide what to do with it, while some younger citizens have inherited properties in areas they have no intention of moving to. And having a second home in Italy means paying taxes, so selling these unused houses off cheaply can be more lucrative than keeping them. That's why around 25 Italian towns are making prospective homeowners an offer they can't refuse. A house for the symbolic price of one euro. This has attracted headlines many times before, where buyers can basically pay one euro for a piece of property in a picturesque Italian village with a small population. This is one of those strategies, but of course this doesn't actually mean what it says. Sure, the home is one euro, but you're left renovating it completely yourself. Sometimes there's tax breaks for this or a small budget given, but usually you end up forking over $30,000 to fix the houses up right after, which, don't get me wrong, is still very cheap for a beautiful home in some quaint Italian village. But it's not exactly free. And that's before the legal fees which aren't free either. Another strategy being used is just giving out cash incentives instead. For example, the region of Calabria, known for its fertile terrain, ancient villages and clear waters, is offering a payment to people 40 years old or younger $31,000 to relocate to a village with 2,000 residents or fewer. The island of Sardinia is doing the same, offering $15,000 per person to relocate to villages with less than 3,000 people. Ironically, these towns' very nature as ghost towns spark interest in them as well. For many, the idea of a depopulated town, sort of in a state of sleeping beauty as the Italians would call it, possess an almost mystic quality that makes each one of them worth seeing. And although most people today prefer to live in a fast-paced environment, these towns do represent the other option that so many people are looking for as well. Tranquility, safety, peacefulness, and slow moving. So maybe, just maybe, they'll repopulate a bit. But with over 6,000 of these towns facing this problem, some will and some unfortunately won't. Thank you for watching. And again, thank you to MyHeritage for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to sign up for a 14-day trial for free using my link in the description below or scanning the QR code on the screen. And I'll see you in the next one.